So, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a very encouraging sight to see you all got here in time. I think that's a remarkable achievement and quite unlike most conferences I've ever been to. Um, uh, we have three speakers this morning, and I'm going to proceed as in previous, issue, uh, previous occasions, that's to say I'm going to ask them to speak in sequence, and then we'll group the questions at the end. And our first speaker is my good friend Urs Loy from Zürich, who is the director of Rare Book Department in the Zentralbibliothek and a specialist of Swiss Reformation humanist scholars, Glarianus uh, Zwingli, the reformer, Bullinger, and most especially, Konrad Gessner. And he's published a very remarkable book, various exhibition catalogues and so on, on Gessner, but also a very remarkable book, Konrad Gessner, Universalgelehrte und Naturforscher der Renaissance, which came out in 2016. And today he's going to talk, as you can see, about the prices of books. Yes. <clears throat> As far as the German-speaking part of Switzerland and southern Germany are concerned, unfortunately there exist hardly no sources on printers, printing presses and their economical situation during the 16th century. The well-known account book of the Basel printers Froben and Episcopius for the years 1557 to 1564 must be called an exception. For most printing shops, no or nearly no economical sources, bills, receipts, book catalogues, inventories or correspondences survived. Only from the Basel printer Johannes Oporinus are preserved a relatively large amount of 800 letters. If the book historian wants to deal with the print production of the Swiss Confederation and the South and Germany, he has to look for other sources to help him. During the following 20 minutes, I would like to present you a few of these sources. Most of them are either only known to a few very specialized researchers or have not yet been taken into account by book historians. Concerning the book history of Zurich, it is a big loss that the archive of the most important printer of the 16th century, Christoph Froschauer the Elder, was completely destroyed at the latest in the early 20th century. It is very sad that we know little about the man and his employees who printed all the famous Zurich Bibles and published almost all the important works of the Zurich reformers. Nevertheless, there are a couple of nearly unknown sources which shed some light on him and his printing shop. First, we have to mention the correspondence of the reformer Ulrich Zwingli, with at about 1,000 letters, and the exchange of letters of the reformer Heinrich Bullinger with roughly 11,000 letters. And at least, not at least, the correspondence of the polymath Konrad Gessner with about 600 unpublished letters. The correspondence of Bullinger is only published until 1546, and only a small part of Gessner's correspondence is edited. If one studies these letters with the focus on book historical information, one finds not only a lot of announcements of new publications, but also interesting news on book prices and other details on book historical aspects. They provide also information on the names of the employees, the prices for books and bindings, the times of production, the distribution channels, and much more. Another Zurich speciality are the private libraries of the reformers, especially that of the reformer Rudolf Qualter. He possessed around 400 titles, in the case of approximately 100 titles, he not only noted his name and year of acquisition on the title page, but also the price. Let us turn our attention to Basel, the most important city of printing in Switzerland during the 16th century. 
There again are two correspondences that have been almost completely ignored by book historians until now. On the one hand, there are the already mentioned and still only partially published letters of the printer Johannes Oporin, and on the other hand, the correspondence of the lawyer Bonifatius Ammerbach, a member of the famous printer family Ammerbach. The edition of his correspondence in 11 volumes has been finished already eight years ago. It contains hundreds of references to new publications, wages, prizes, distribution channels, and so on, but nearly no book historian has exploited this rich treasure. Completely unknown to the researchers are various unedited catalogues that Ammerbach left behind, such as lists of new publications from Lyon. Bookseller catalogues with prices or inventories of books, book deliveries to Duke Christoph von Württemberg, which contains jurisprudential titles from Lyon, Venice and Basel, with a separate list of the prices for the books and another list for the bindings. You see here on the left, Ammerbach's list uh, of books, which he sent to Duke Christoph von Württemberg, and the prizes for the books. And on the right side, you see another inventory for the prizes for the bindings. <coughs> if one looks around in southern <coughs> Germany, namely Württemberg, which had a certain affinity to Switzerland during the 16th century, the informations relevant to the economic history of the book are largely limited to price entries on various title pages or to more random notes in individual correspondences. A laudable exception are the documents from the archive of Hans Unknauts printing press in Urach near Tübingen, which are now kept in the archive of the University of Tübingen. Hans Unknaut von Weistenwolf was an Austrian statesman who resigned in 1556 after he had tried in vain as a Lutheran to establish religious freedom during the reign of Emperor Ferdinand I. He founded the printing house in Urach near Tübingen, which was specialized in printing and distributing Protestant literature in Italian, Slovenian and Croatian language. The extensive source material contains correspondence, accounts, receipts, information on travel expenses and wages, as well as on the dispatch and distribution of the books. Let me try to give you a brief overview of the information we can filter out from the sources described. A word in advance on the currencies. There are above all two currency systems which are mentioned in the sources, namely the guilder system and the crown system. So one guilder is two pounds, 15 batzen or 40 shillings. And in Basel we have the crown. The crown makes 1.66 guilders. For a better understanding of the amounts, I will mention it is helpful to compare the numbers with the income of the people. A Zurich Bible, for example, printed in 1531, in one volume, costed with a good binding, three guilders or 120 shillings. The salary of a printer was roughly 30 shillings per week, and even a pastor, pastor had not more than 60 shillings per week. So the printer had to work four weeks, the pastor two weeks, to buy a Zurich Bible in folio. <coughs> The biggest investment for a printer was certainly the formation or takeover of a printing shop. It is known from the Basel printer Andreas Kratander that he sold his firm for 7,000 guilders, while Froschauer sold his company to his nephew in 1564 for 9,400 guilders, and he was convinced that this was a good price. The reason for the considerable difference of more than 2,000 guilders between Kratander and Froschauer lies very probably primarily in the different infrastructure of the two companies. If 
the printer already owned the infrastructure of rooms, presses, letters and equipment, wages and paper remained the two most intensive cost factors. A letter from Proschauer to the reformer Vadian in St. Gallen from April 30, 1540, shows that he paid about six guilders for a bolt of paper, this means ten reams, which corresponded which corresponded to what Froben and Episcopius, as well as Hans Ungnad, had to spend for paper six guilders a bolt. For Zurich there is no indication of the level of the wages for the employees, but the accounts of Froben and Episcopius show that the proofreader received 26 to 40 shillings per week, a typesetter 36 to 60 shillings, and the printer 28 to 33 shillings, depending on their output. This is in line with the salaries handed down by Hans Ungnat from Tübingen, who also paid the printer about 30 shillings per week. It should be noted here that various employees could not expect regular working hours, but were hired as required. On the other hand, it could also happen that suddenly too many people were standing around in the printing shop and the owner was desperately looking for work. As Froschauer wrote to Wadian in 1540, at the moment I have a lot of employees but less work. It is therefore understanding that the printers ensured that all employees were busy and that the machines were running at full <coughs> capacity. It was therefore not worthwhile for large printing shops, in particular to accept small orders. It is clear from various sources that jobs for printing less than a few hundred copies were not worthwhile unless the printing was subsidized as was the case with official decrees and mandates. In 1537, Froschauer therefore refused to reprint 600 copies of the St. Gall Catechism because this would give him only half a day's work. In fact, Froschauer was reluctant to accept jobs for printing narrow publications because the cost-benefit ratio was much worse than for large works. More than a decade earlier, the Basel printers Hans Welsch and Thomas Wolff had already stated that the printing of only 300 copies was not worthwhile, not even to cover the costs. This guideline of a minimum of several hundred copies was valid not only within the Swiss Confederation, but also abroad, such as in Poland. The two printers from Krakow, Scharfenberger and Lazarus, agreed only to print short runs if the customer himself purchased 400 to 500 copies and paid all the expenses. Salaries for illustrators and translators are also documented in these sources. The Zurich printer Christoph Froschauer wrote to Vadian on January 18, 1545, that he had employed the Strasbourg artist Heinrich Vogtherr to produce the woodcuts for the famous Swiss chronicle written by Johannes Stumpf. <coughs> he paid him two guilders per week and granted him board and lodging. This generous remuneration was paid not only for artists, but also to translators. The account books of the printing press of Hans Ungnaut in Tübingen <coughs> show that the translator, who translated the Confessio Augustana into Italian, received a quarter guilder, or ten shillings, per printed octavo sheet. For a folio sheet, the translator earned thirty shillings. That was a good thing to live with. So it was no exaggeration when the Jewish convert Michael Adam claimed in 1548 that Froschauer had promised him 100 guilders for translations. The royalties for authors in Basel and Zürich were more than half as much lower, lower because the printers paid one guilder for the text of six printed folio sheets, folio leaves. Apart from wages, it is also interesting to see <coughs> how long it took for a title to appear. It has to be taken into account that the printing presses and their performance have changed at least twice in the 15th, 16th century. 
The first step was from the simple press to the so-called two-phase press. The second step from the two-phase press to the press with metal spindles and cranks, which were in use since around the middle of the 16th century. The correspondence between the Basel printer Johannes Operin and the Zürich reformer Heinrich Buringer explains how long it took to print his commentary on the revelation of John in folio format in 1557. Oporin printed 1,100 copies of this over 600 page folio work. On May 6th, he reported to Bullinger that the work was in print. He sent him the first sheets for correction and announced his intention to finish the work for the next Frankfurt Book Fair. <coughs> Further deliveries of proofs in so called terniones followed until August. A ternio consists of three sheets that have been placed one inside the other and folded together to form a layer. On July 1st, Oporin wrote to Bullinger that the work was almost finished. We can see that even extensive works could be produced in a very short time. Oporin's average press output was thus 1,100 copies of one and a half sheets per day, which corresponded to the output provided by the Frankfurt Order for Printers and Typesetters of 5062-63. From the hundreds of traditional book prizes which I have seen in letters, booksellers, catalogues and on title pages, I have not yet succeeded in deriving a generally valid rule for pricing. I have the impression that the total costs have been allocated individually to the individual titles, whereby the following factors have played a role. The format, amount of pages, the paper quality, density of typesetting, expected demand, print run, illustrations, binding, subject, topic, language, new acquisition or antiquarian purchase, transport cost of the books, and so on. A rough study of over 100 16th century book prizes in the Zentralbibliothek Zürich has shown that the books in the three formats, folio, quarto and octavo, cost at maximum £10, £4 or £2. This means that size and of course number of pages were certainly decisive factors for the book price. The fact that this was not only due to objective criteria, such as, the out, such as the output of the typesetter or paper consumption, can be seen very clearly from different letters. One, for example, was written by Konrad de Kostenes in Basel, who wrote to Bullinger on April 28, 1553, that he had received only one copy of the Chronologia written by Johannes Funk in folio for three guilders from Frankfurt, and that he therefore could not send him another copy. But he would ensure that such a useful work would be printed for the next book fair in Basel, at the more affordable price in quarto. The same title, with the same amount of text, was therefore cheaper if it was offered in quarto than in folio. Due to the book prizes, which I have encountered mainly in Swiss libraries, it is also not possible for me to deduce a trend for the 16th, a significant trend for the 16th century, that books between 5020 and 5080 would have become cheaper or more expensive in the course of time. On the contrary, if you look at the cost for bindings in Zurich, for example, they remain stable for, de <coughs> for decades. This is the gray. <coughs> These are the gray, the gray dots. You see they stay on the same level for decades. There are strong fluctuations in food prices, especially for wheat, a moderate increase in wages, but a complete standstill for the cost of bindings in wood and leather here in the graph, <coughs> for example, for volumes over 500 pages. These figures are taken from the account books of the Hohe Schule in Zürich, which also show how much was been spent for books and on the bindings of the books. When we discover a price in a book, it is sometimes difficult to decide 
whether or not the binding is included in the price. In addition, the prices could differ depending on where the book was bought because the cost for customs and transportation were added to the price. And this is Simon Sulzer wrote to Bullinger from Basel on January 21, 1556, that he wanted to buy his commentaries on the Gospels, but the Basel booksellers would sell them at a more expensive price than the Zurich booksellers. He asked whether Bullinger could motivate Froschauer to send them to him on the level of the Zurich price. In addition, the correspondences repeatedly show that certain printers sold books to their friends for the same price as they sold them to the booksellers. There was therefore the possibility of circumventing the book trade for the inner circle of confidence. This raises the question of, high, of how high was the bookseller's profit margin. This question cannot be answered unequivocally from my sources. A letter from Ambrosius Plarer to Bullinger dated from January 18, 1548 shows that the bookseller Gregor Mangold from Constance bought the work with the title Sieben Wort Christi, written by Johannes Zwick, for four and a half pfennige and sold it for six pfennige. So his profit counted one and a half pfennige or 25%. The sources mentioned also contain information about messenger wages, the cost of packing material, or the profits made at the Frankfurt Book Fair, but due to time constraint, I cannot go into detail here. Finally, I would like to take a brief look at the antiquarian book markets. Here I came across various documents showing that antiquarian books often, not always, but often have been sold at the flat rate. Heinrich Bullinger wrote to Ambrosius Plarer that 56 books were currently available from Werner Steiner's library in Zug, namely the folio volumes each for 10 batzen, the quarto volumes for 4 or 5 batzen, and the octavo volumes for 3 batzen. <coughs> from the Amerbach correspondence it emerges that the schoolmaster of St. Peter's in Basel handed over legal books for 2 batzen per piece. Allow me please to come to the end, not with conclusions, but with questions. I would be very grateful if you have the answers. <laughs> How high was the profit margin for printers and booksellers? How much did the transport cost affect the price at the location other than the printing location? The Amelbach correspondence shows that imprints from Lyon were more expensive than others. Why? Thank you for your attention.